I remind members that they are expected to wear face coverings when they are not speaking in the debate. This is in line with the current government guidance and that of the House of Commons Commission. I also remind members uh, that they are asked by the House to have a COVID lateral flow test twice a week if coming on to the parliamentary estate. This can be done either by testing centre in the House or at home. Please also give each other and members of staff space when seated and when entering and leaving the room. Thank you very much for you. I now call Tonia Antonazzi to move the motion. I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 582336 relating to the discharge of sewage by water companies. Thank you, Mr Paisley, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And it is an honour to be leading this debate on behalf of the Petitions Committee. Now, this petition calls for an outright ban on water companies discharging raw sewage into watercourses. And personally, I think a lot of our constituents will be shocked to know that it is currently legal for water companies to do this. How can it be okay for these multi-million pound businesses to absolve themselves of the responsibility for making sure that our rivers and streams and ultimately our seas are free from harmful sewage flowing in it? Firstly, I would like to pay tribute to Ferry Harmer who started this petition after seeing Fergal Sharkey raise some of the issues around the state of our rivers on the TV programme Mortimer and Whitehouse Gone Fishing last year. And I would also like to thank the 111,434 people from around the UK who have taken the time to sign this petition, and especially to the 186 people from Gower who have signed. In fact, I have also had nearly 150 constituents get in touch with me about this issue in one way or another. And I think that that demonstrates the strength of feeling about this issue, which is featured very recently in the news. When I spoke to Ferry, he was a man of real passion and determination. He spoke about the petition and told me that 41% of fish species are in decline in British waters and a third of species are in serious decline, including iconic fish like salmon and trout. Through my research on this, I have discovered, quite frankly, ast uh, frankly, astounding facts about the state of our rivers and waterways. There were 35 and 39 million tonnes of sewage discharged into the River Thames alone in 2019. That's one river in one year. And last year, raw sewage was discharged in our waters more than 400,000 times. 400,000 times. It's quite an incredible figure. But this has now become an emergency for our waterways. Not a single river in England is in a healthy condition. Not a single river is meeting a good chemical standard and over 85% don't meet good ecological standards and quite frankly this isn't good enough. I am fortunate to represent arguably the best coastal community in the UK. The course around Gower is popular all year round with families and tourists in the summer, oh well, all year, and I have a growing number of local wild swimming groups that have taken off you know, over lockdown. It's the only contact that people have with the outside. It's been a saviour to so many people. Unlike the, the, the well-known mermaids and other groups, there is some of the best surfing in the UK. So I will do anything I can to protect our vital ecosystem, seafood production economy and thriving tourist economy. Now, I know, uh, Chair, that this is a devolved area, but as I have asked in a recent DEFRA questions, this is a UK-wide issue. And what work is the Minister doing and what commitment can she give to work alongside the devolved administrations because these waterways, uh, England, Wales, Scotland, England, they're all intertwined and they all end up somewhere. Now, if sewage is going into our rivers and waterways, it's ultimately, ultimately making its way to the sea and even into our food chain through seafood and fish. I know we're all supposed to be encouraging recycling, but even I think that is going a little too far. And... This government is failing in its duty of care here. The state of our waterways hasn't improved since 2016, despite ministerial claims that they are cleaning up their act. And what's even worse is that the unlawful discharge of sewage could be up to 10 times higher than the rate of prosecutions by the Environment Agency. And whilst the Environment Agency are responsible for monitoring and enforcement of water quality breaches, they have fallen foul of this government's cuts. 
The Environment Agency funding has been slashed by 63% since 2010. Simple measures such as the number of points where samples are, are, you know, can be collected have been cut by over 40%. So how are we, how can we continue to monitor the health of our rivers if there is less data being collected? In the government's own response to this petition, they mention that water companies have agreed, and I quote, to make available real-time data on sewage discharge from storm overflows at designated bathing points all year round from this year. This data will be made available to help surfers, swimmers and other recreational water users to check the latest information and make informed choices on where to swim. I mean, who doesn't want to check the amount of human waste, used sanitary products and anything else people have flushed away into the water before they go for a swim? That's not a delightful thought. But let's not forget the words of the then Secretary of State for DEFRA, the Right Honourable Member for Surrey Heath, back in 2019 when he told the Environmental Audit Committee, Committee that divergence from tough EU rules would be an opportunity for the UK Government to implement unquestionably tougher restrictions. Mm -hmm. He said that being different can sometimes mean being better and that leavers did not automatically advocate for diversion out of a desire to lower standards. But due to Brexit, we have seen a shortage of HGV drivers and an increase in red tape, which has led to chemicals not being available to fully treat wastewater before it's discharged. And what's more, the government have granted permissions for the discharge to take place. But I'm not just here to outline the increasing problems that the government are exacerbating, but I have received a number of suggestions of things that the government can put into place to reverse some of the damage that is happening. The Clean Up Our Waterways needs a fully funded and resourced action plan. We need targets for water companies and serious consequences when they break the rules. One way of doing this is to increase the environmental reporting requirement for water companies. So I would call upon the government to improve on their plan to introduce annual reports, for example, quarterly reports. Because if we have more regular reporting and the system that does this, then we can see where there are problem areas and react in a much more efficient way. Will my friend give uh, Yes, I will. Uh, I'm grateful to my old friend for giving uh, way. <clears throat> does she also think there should be a requirement on the water companies to report that information to their consumers, perhaps in the form of a formal consumer committee uh, of that uh, water company, so that, water, so that that water company is more likely to be able to be held to account by the very consumers who are suffering from this uh, dumping of sewage. I thank my honourable friend for his, his comment there. I think that is key. Accountability is what is needed. And if we are going to move forward, having that consumer committee that he speaks about is exactly what we need, a practical solution in order to move forward. But I welcome the government's commitment to introduce new measures to reduce sewage discharge from storm overflows. But this, unfortunately, doesn't go far enough. The government must eliminate sewage discharges. And this is why the Labour Party voted in favour of the Duke of Wellington's amendment, which called for exactly that. And the government's aim of publishing a plan on this by September 2020 is just, 22, sorry, is just not good enough. Let's have that plan in place early next year. This has been dragging on for far too long, and there is no reason why we can't have a strategy sooner. If ministers are serious about reaching the targets for cleaning our rivers, lakes, streams and seas, then they must have a fully resourced action plan for monitoring water quality and holding companies to account. But there are also high-tech solutions that could be employed immediately. Ferry mentioned a, a system called Hybax, Hybrid Activated Sludge Process, which doesn't sound absolutely delightful, but it's cheaper and more effective than the system companies are currently using. To me, that sounds like a pretty obvious thing for the water companies to put in place. And where there are capital expenditure issues, it must fall to the government to ultimately step in and protect the waterways. Natural mitigations can also provide solutions to this problem, reintroducing beavers, building more reservoirs and increasing tree and hedgerow planting. 
The Minister has plenty to answer for my contribution, but I would also like to know how many water companies have been fined by the Environmental Agency, and how much have they been fined, and when did the Minister last meet with the Environmental Agency to discuss this? Chair, I bring my conclusions to a close, uh, my contribution to a close by asking the Government to be bold in doing the right thing and getting our rivers and streams cleaned up and listen to the advice of experts beef up the Environment and Agency's powers and keep pushing water companies to take responsibility for not just those people that signed the petition, but for everybody living in the United Kingdom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. The question is that the House has considered e-petition 582336 relating to the discharge of sewage by water companies. I'm just having a wee look around. People stay in the so they see who else is interested. Thank you. That's very helpful. I'm now going to call Maria Miller. It's a great pleasure to see you in the chair and to have the opportunity to debate this really important issue. And I have to start by saying that the government's new Environment Act uh, goes further than ever to help reduce water pollution in our rivers and our seas, now and in the future, and, and in many ways directly addresses uh, a, men, a number of the points that the Honourable Lady Fagawa has already raised in this debate today. Yet an orchestrated campaign on social media left many thousands of our constituents, people who really care about the quality of our water and river pollution, being bombarded with misinformation. Uh, now, the Honourable Member for Gower has been very constructive in her contribution to this debate, and I'm sure other members will be. Um, but I hope that this debate will ensure that the true facts are on the record, facts, not fiction. Fact is, the fact is that there is nothing new in this Environment Act that creates a right for water companies to dump raw sewage in our watercourses, and it's a fact that this bill, for the first time, creates a statutory duty at the most accountable level of all, the top of government, to better monitor water quality upstream and downstream of our sewage works, to reduce discharges from stor storm overflows, and also to have clear plans on how to eliminate storm overflows completely in England, and that those plans have to be in place, not in some distant date, but in a year's time. Now, these are real improvements, and the bill also goes on to, to establish for the Environment Agency a new duty to publish storm flow overflow data annually, and that water companies will have a duty to publish real-time storm overflow information too, quite different to the social media disinformation campaign, which created such heightened concern and probably led to this debate today. Now, these are real improvements that matter in my own constituency, Mr Paisley, because we are home to a rare north-flowing salmonoid chalk stream, of which there are only 200 in the world. The Loddon springs out of the ground in Buckskin, in the centre of Basingstoke, and also in my own village of Maple Dirwell, and in the surrounding fields. And by the time it reaches the sewage works in Chinham, where uh, discharges occur, it's only two or three miles away, and it's still little more than a stream. So back in 2006, a water cycle study was undertaken by the local authority to model the impact of large-scale house building, of which Basingstoke has, has undertaken a great deal of in the last two decades, to undertake a large-scale uh, a, a water cycle study on the impact on the River Loddon. And I have been working with the Environment Agency in Thames Water since for more than a decade, Mr Paisley, to ensure that we see improvements and protections for the quality of our river and that our sewage works in Chinham has, um, has the right measures in place. Indeed, it has one of the toughest consent levels in the country for phosphates. And in 2015, new technology was trialled at the plant after some successful lobbying to switch it to Basingstoke rather than it happening somewhere else. So we've been doing a great deal, but we welcome the extra measures in the bill or in the Act, indeed, um, to, to go even further. Because some as aspects of the river have improved, but others have not. Now, some of this the Minister, I think, can help with, but others she simply can't. Uh, indeed, we've seen a, a significant increase in our local crayfish population in the Loddon, which has tipped the river into poor status, not because there's been an increase in pollution, but because the crayfish eat 
the eggs of the coarse fish. Um, and I think some of this detail is often lost in some of the social media campaigns, which can perhaps misrepresent uh, uh, what is uh, the information that's gathered by the Environment Agency. And I would be interested to know from the Minister what work she's going to be doing to help educate local councillors, perhaps, um, and also local schools on, on some of this information. Now, this new Act also gives more opportunity to tackle storm water discharges, and that is incredibly welcome. Because let's be clear, at the moment, if those discharges didn't happen, the stormwater would simply flood homes and businesses, and that would be completely unacceptable as well. So the measures in the new Act means that there need to be plans developed, not just to reduce stormwater, but eventually to eliminate it as well. And that's very important for me, again, Mr Paisley, locally, because in 2020, we saw an almost unprecedented level of rainfall in April, leading to um, the Loddon experiencing 40 overflow events. Um, as I say, uh, almost, we believe, unprecedented, because there was insufficient space to store the qual quantity of stormwater um, it had to be released into the river. But the situation is not particularly predictable. This year there have been only two such events, but we need to make sure that if there are problems in the future with increased water levels, that we, or increased rainfall levels, it can be dealt with. Now, one of the significant contributory causes to this problem is house builders having the automatic right to connect rainwater drainage to the sewage system. And I'd like to um, just really focus on this with the Minister. We need the Government to bring into force Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act 2010, which removes developers' automatic right to connect rainwater drainage to combined sewers, which can put additional stormwater pressure on our sewage, sewage works capacity. So what plans have the Government got to tackle that particular piece of legislation still yet unenacted? In terms of um, other reasons why we have overflows in Basin State, they're caused by high levels of groundwater infiltrating the Thames Water Network. Now, Thames Water are working on that through a scheme uh, relining sewers, which will run from 2025 to 2030. But I'm concerned that that, plus two upgrades at the, the Basingstoke Sewage Works to increase capacity, has meant that Thames Water see, doesn't see Basingstoke as a priority for investment in the future because of the significant amount of work they've already done, particularly around this issue. Now, this Environment Bill requires, or the, the Environment Act, requires um, a plan to be in place to make improvements at every stage um, into the future. But I would like to perhaps stress to the Minister, particularly for rivers like the Loddon, which is little more than a stream, as I've pointed out, as it runs past the Basingstoke Sewage Works, yet is subject to the same national stormwater overflow rules as much larger bodies of water. And that simply can't be right. So could the Minister set out how plans to reduce and eliminate storm overflow events can take into account the very different size of watercourses involved. The Loddon may have one of the lowest numbers of overflow events in Thames Valley and then makes it less of a priority for Thames Water, but it's a very small tributary to the Thames when it receives overflow water in Basingstoke. I'd like to close, Mr P uh, Paisley, by just paying tribute to this Minister's work on this issue. She has made so much progress um, on the issue of water quality and I think it's very fitting that we have this debate today with her ability to, to respond to it. Thank you. I'm not putting a formal time limit on, um, but if members could keep in mind around five minutes, we'll get everybody in who wishes to speak with comfort. I now call Tim Farron. And I see you, Mr Morris. I see you. Uh, great pleasure to serve in your chairmanship, uh, Mr Paisley. Thank you very much for calling me. Um, and uh, hugely grateful to the Honourable Member for, for Gower for not just securing this debate, but making an excellent uh, start to it. Um, I'm sure uh, members will forgive me if I focus much of what I say on the situation in my communities, the English lakes in uh, Cumbria. We're probably the wettest part of England. Uh, storm overflow is a daily thing uh, for, for, uh, for us. Uh, we need to keep those lakes topped up so we don't complain. We do complain about the water companies taking advantage of that in order to justify overflows, which I think none of us would accept as being uh, in any way acceptable. Uh, Windermere, um, the largest lake in England, uh, the, the reservoir of last resort for Greater Manchester, um, it contains three uh, designated bathing areas which are of good standard. 
So I don't want to uh, make the case that Windermere uh, is uh, an open sewer or anything like that. Of course, it is not. Nevertheless, on 71 solid days last year, United Utilities dumped raw sewage into that lake. Um, and that is utterly unacceptable. Uh, if we look at the other issues affecting phosphate levels in that lake, we have maybe a quarter to a third of all the phosphates in the lake uh, coming via septic tanks. Uh, there is a complete lack of registration and regulation of septic tanks, no help for those people who have them. You talk to people in the Environment Agency who do a great job on the ground in Cumbria, they will say the only reason they know where the septic tanks even are is by a process of elimination because they know what's on the mains and therefore what isn't. And that's not acceptable. We need to make sure there's a proper system of registration, regulation and help for people with septic tanks so that we can preserve and protect our lakes and the quality of them. But it's not just the lakes in South Cumbria that struggle and where the water companies take advantage of the uh, permission that they effectively have to dump sewage into our waterways. The River Kent at Burnside, uh, the Kent and the Gowan at Staveley uh, and the Kent at Wattsfield in Kendall have seen sometimes you know, catastrophic e emissions and in the likes of Burnside and Staveley, it doesn't even take much of a, of, a, of a storm, even not even a huge downpour, to see terrible raw sewage on the streets in those beautiful lakes villages. That is not acceptable, and we have to look at what the government is willing and able to do to make sure that water companies do the right thing to keep our waterways um, clean and, and at a level that we would consider acceptable. I hear what has been said about the Environment Bill. I am massively sceptical about the government's uh, amendment at the last minute. It does indeed take uh, the Duke of Wellington's wording about uh, progressively... Uh, reducing uh, harmful emissions and the duty on those water companies. There's a time scale for a report, but there's no time scale for improvement and there's no volume references when it comes to improvement either. How much sewage is acceptable, for example? So I can tell you that 40% of the phosphates in Windermere are down to United Utilities. Will 39% be acceptable after five years, two years? These are the things which leave people sceptical that the amendment the government made last week provided good cover for Conservative backbenchers and a free range for, uh, free reign for the water companies to effectively carry on doing what they have already and always been doing. Um, the Honourable Member for Gower asked some really important questions uh, about fines that the water companies have paid. I wrote uh, a written question to the Minister and I'm very pleased that she answered uh, to a very similar question. And, and the answer to how many in the last four years water companies have been prosecuted and fined is 11 successful prosecutions in four years. Four of those prosecutions were for less than £50,000. In the northwest of England there wasn't one single prosecution since 2018. United Utilities, nevertheless, were guilty of five of the ten longest discharges in the last year. And so we're seeing a pattern here of water companies being allowed to get away with murder and not held to account. Yep, yeah, happy to give away. On him. He's making a very important point about enforcement. On Friday of this week, Thames Water will appear in court, and I won't go into the details for obvious reasons, for a case that was taken five years for the Environment Agency to bring to court. They've known it was serious enough to require prosecution. Why does it take them so long? I'm very grateful for his intervention and also for his work on this area, highlighting this issue, and, um, and we have much to be grateful to him for. And the point that he makes is absolutely right, that we can have you know, um, uh, policies, but if they aren't enforced, if the water companies can factor into the fact, factor into their, their, their spending plans, that a fine of maybe less than £50,000 is a small price to pay when they're able to dish out to their shareholders £2 billion uh, in uh, dividends each year. So I'm absolutely proud of the English lakes and of our waterways. We have uh, glorious uh, lakes and rivers and streams in our community, and I want to keep them clean. And the water companies have the permission at the moment to take advantage of the fact that they are allowed to uh, have these emissions, and the reality is that they're not being held to account via the legal process. So I would like the Minister to reflect on those issues that have been raised and tell me what plan that she has to help us in the Lake District make sure that you know, our best visitor attraction in the country and our biggest outside of London is kept something clean and pristine that we can all remain proud of. We get the remaining 12 backbench speeches and I will have to cut to four minutes each. I call Robbie Moore. Um, thank you and it's a pleasure serving your 
Chairmanship, Mr Paisley, and I thank uh, the Honourable Member for Gower on behalf of the Petitions Committee in bringing forward this really important debate. And it's great to see so many members um, around the table for what is um, such a, an important uh, topic. Um, and indeed for me, cleaning up our river system, improving our water quality within our river stre uh, streams and rivers is incredibly important. And in my constituency, we have the River Wharf, which is the only river yet in the UK to have secured bathing water status. And after decades of inaction, I have to say that I am very proud that this government are the ones who are doing something about it. Many people that will have signed this petition will have done so in advance of the Environment uh, Bill having secured uh, Royal Assembly as of last week. Now, during these discussions, we have had many falsehoods put across by the media and by, I have to say, members on the other side who have used this as an opportunity um, to um, uh, capitalise on uh, a fact of falsehoods in uh, many arguments that have been put forward um, in many debates over recent weeks. So I want to use this as an opportunity to set the record straight. Members in this place have never voted to allow water companies to pump sewerage into rivers. What we have done is voted for a piece of legislation which will go to greater lengths to clean up our rivers and uh, to much greater lengths than what we've ever seen before. With the Environment Bill now having secured royal assent last week, we have voted for a duty to directly put on water companies to produce comprehensive statutory drainage and sewage management plans, setting out how water companies will manage and develop their uh, drainage and sewage um, system over the next 25 years. And of course, we have voted for a power of direction for the government to direct water companies in relation to their actions in these drainage and sewage management plans. The government will also have the ability to use their power of uh, direction if the plans are not good enough. And this, of course, is a powerful tool. We've also voted for uh, the government uh, to produce a statutory plan to reduce discharges uh, from storm overflow, something which we are all incredibly passionate about in this House because we have seen for too often um, drain, uh, sewerage getting into the river system through uh, storm overflows not working correctly. And now the government has the ability to put more pressure on water companies. We've also voted for a requirement for the government to produce a report setting out the actions that should uh, be needed to eliminate discharges from storm overflows in England and the costs and benefits of those actions. Both publications are required before the 1st of September next year. And again, we have voted for a new duty to be placed on water companies and the Environment Agency to publish data on storm overflow operation on an annual basis. Again, we voted for a new duty um, on water companies uh, to publish real-time information on the operation of storm flows. This we mean, will mean that it is absolutely clear how often storm overflows are being used, which will aid enforcement. Because again, I reiterate that the Environment Agency, in my view, have not gone um, strong enough in holding water companies to account. And yet, we have voted for an Environment Bill which will do this. And again, we have voted for a new duty directly on, uh, to place on water companies to monitor the uh, water quality upstream and downstream of storm overflows and sewage disposal works. In July of this year, the government set out for the first time ever its expectation on Ofwat, who are the regulator, um, uh, who are in charge of uh, monitoring um, both the water companies and the Environment Agency, uh, should incentivise water companies to invest significantly to reduce the use of storm overflows. Mr Paisley, I was proud to serve on the Environment Bill Committee, and I was delighted to see the Environment Bill become law. But it is, a great, and it is great to see so many people across the country so passionate about this issue. Cleaning up rivers is vitally important to us all, but I have to say it was deeply disappointing to see that members on the other side of this House not vote for any of the mechanisms or any of the measures which I have just outlined in this uh, speech. Whilst the opposition make a lot of noise on this topic, it is on this side of the House that we act, and it is in fact act, and it is thanks to the Environment Act that we can now finally begin to stop sewage discharge uh, getting into our rivers. Yeah, yeah, very good. Becca Long Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Paisley. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I'd also like to thank the Honourable Member for Gower for securing this very important debate and her speech, which I very much agree with. 
The Rivers Trust have shown multiple sewer storm overflow incidents in the city of Salford, centering around the River Irwell and the Manchester Ship Canal. And last year, as we've heard, water companies dumped raw sewage into England's rivers and seas 400,000 times. So it will take more than regulation to fix the problem. Indeed, the water industry has been regulated since it was privatised in 1989 and fining many water companies millions of pounds has demonstrably not affected their behaviour. Yorkshire Water and United Utilities, for example, have even tried to claim in court that they are not public authorities and shouldn't have to publish data on sewage. Of course, as a result of privatisation in 1989, our water and sewage are now run by nine regional private monopolies, which are mostly owned by private equity. Since privatisation, water bills have increased by 40% in real terms. And I water in new research from the University of Greenwich shows that the water and sewage companies have paid shareholders a total of nearly £17 billion in dividends from 2010 to 21, an average of 1.4 billion a year. It's estimated the privatised English water companies paid out 57 billion in dividends to shareholders over the three decades since privatisation. This is almost half as much as the money they've spent on upgrading and maintaining water and sewage systems. And worse, six water companies were found to be avoiding millions in tax and the Financial Times reported on the huge debt piling up in the water industry, confirming that our water bills are rising to pay for huge shareholder payouts, not to invest in infrastructure. So the truth is, privatisation of our water industry was wrong, and it has been a complete failure for the British public. But the good news is that bringing, public, bringing water into public ownership would actually pay for itself within around seven years. After that, it would save the public purse £2.5 billion a year. This money could be invested in infrastructure to stop sewage pouring into our rivers, lakes and seas, as well as reducing leaks to save water and cutting bills. And these new public water companies could be democratically controlled, transparent and given a duty of care to take care of our environment, clean up our rivers and seas and to do everything they can to tackle the climate crisis. So there's no excuse not to do this. In Scotland, water is already in public ownership. In Wales, it's a not-for-profit. And in the last 15 years, 235 cities in 37 countries have taken their water into public ownership. So I'm sure we all agree here today that it is unacceptable for raw sewage to flow into our rivers and seas. But I stress if we are really serious about tackling this ecological scandal, we must bring England's water companies into public hands. Thank you. Sir Roger Gale. This year, Southern Water were fined £90 million for pumping raw sewage into the sea. To take the point made by my right honourable friend, the member for Ludlow, that wasn't a quick prosecution. That was for 2010 to 2015. This summer, this summer, there was raw sewage on the beaches of East Kent. Devastating for holidaymakers, dreadful for the tourism industry. And I don't doubt that inland there was sewage going into our chalk streams as well. It has got to stop. It won't surprise you, Mr Paisley, to know that I have been in fairly regular contact with Southern Water about this issue. And indeed, I met with the Chief Executive Ian McCauley and his engineer only last week to discuss possible ways forward. And notwithstanding the motion before the House this evening, it's clear that there isn't a quick fix and nobody should try to pretend that there is. This is certainly years of lack of investment in the infrastructure, but it's going to take a lot of money and engineering to get this right. More important, it's going to take a great deal of cooperation, and this is the point that's been made to me, that I think we all have to understand. This is not just the water company's responsibility. This is the responsibility of Highways England. It's the responsibility of the Housing Department. It's the responsibility, certainly, of the Environment Agency and Natural England, and Ofwat. 
And unless and until all these bodies start working together, we are not going to solve the problem. We're building houses. Uh, my right honourable friend, the member for Basingstoke, made the point. We're building houses and connecting them to sewage. The volume of water coming off house roofs and going down drain pipes, then into gullies, then into the sewers, is monumental. We're building more and more houses without the sewage and water infrastructure to handle what we're putting into the system. We have got to separate out rainwater from sewage. And if we can do that, and we can do it, there's not a single house site I know of at the moment being built with a grey water tank, for example. We're throwing all this water away. There are very few houses that have water butts. There's barely a yard, if there is at all, of tarmac on road that is porous. In other countries, roads are porous. Why aren't they porous in the United Kingdom? So what I say to my right honourable friend, is that my honourable friend the minister, is this. Yes, we have to hold the water companies to account, but we also have to make sure that the Department for Transport and the Department for Local Government and Housing play their part in this, as well as DEFRA, to pull all of the strands together and to have a coordinated approach that, looking to the future, will build us the houses and the roads and the drainage systems that we need for tomorrow not for Victorian England. Mm. Mike Inspray. Thank you, Mr. Basil. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I thank the Honourable Member for Gower for um, securing this debate and responding to the 111,000 people or so that signed this petition, 144 of those from Weaver Vale. My constituency, named quite rightly, after the River Weaver, which cuts straight through my community, has an incredible, important role to play over the centuries in my patch. Since its canalisation in 1732, it became one of the most important commerce routes in the north of England, with transport of salt, in fact, going right back to Roman times, which not only led to the creation of the world-famous Anderson boat lift, but also the renowned ICI works, now in Eosinivan and Tata, which became a vital employer, still is a vital employer, which led to the industrial expansion of Northwich. Today, the River Weaver is haven for wildlife and recreation activities, and it's arguably our greatest natural asset. Without the River Weaver, there would be no Weaver Vale, and it's vital to us that we do everything we can to protect this for future generations. Which is why I and my constituents are disgusted to see that last year raw sewage was regularly pumped into the River Weaver and the Dane at an alarming rate. The Rivers Trust reported that in 2020 alone there were 1,341 spills from storm overflows amounting to a whopping 5,786 hours. That's 241 days. Mr. Paisley, sewage discharges not only make river waters unsafe to swim, swimming for local people, but also damage the habitats of a range of different species that use our waterways. The people of Weaver Vale want our local rivers to be free from raw sewage so that our river systems can thrive and those, ecos and those ecosystems depend on it. Last week, I asked my constituents to contact me about the views on the matter uh, that comes before this chamber today. And there was an overwhelming response. Constituents such as Debbie Graham and Diana French argue that pumping raw sewage into our rivers is outrageous and once again shows how profit is being put before health and the environment. They call for tougher regulations on these United Utility Companies, such as United Utilities. They were all under the impression that their bills were ensuring that these rivers were cleaned up. How about, Minister, taking the shareholders and the directors out of the equation and using that surplus to invest in our waterways, that £57 billion that the uh, Honourable Member for Eccles referred to. 
The recent government-inspired amendment is nothing short of blah, blah, blah that came out of COP26. To put it bluntly, Chair, a vague statement of progressive reduction is talking crap while giving the green light for more crap in our rivers and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paisley, for allowing to me. me to contribute very briefly to this right to important debate. I was intending just to intervene, but if I've got a couple of minutes, I will uh, take advantage of them. Thank you. Uh, I think um, the petition which the Honourable Lady uh, spoke to, and I apologise to her for not being here for her uh, speech, I think was stimulated by the, um, some of the campaign groups with whom i had been working in relation to my private member's bill back in uh, previous year. Um, and I'm, it, it reflected, as has been said by other members this evening, uh, the very widespread sense of growing awareness and horror at the state of our rivers as a consequence of the uncontrolled dumping of sewage into river systems by, a, by water treatment works and uh, the water sewage system which has just been overwhelmed for a whole variety of reasons and I'd just like to touch on two this evening which I think are really important for us to take this forward now that the Environment Act has become a law and I have to say I completely disagree with the suggestion that the amendment that was finally entered into the uh, bill uh, was uh, as described by the Honourable Gentleman with whom I have a lot of time for normally but he's just wrong I'm afraid he's just simply, simply wrong um, that the, uh, the measures in the bill will lead in the Act will lead to a progressive reduction in sewer discharges which will be enforceable in the way that uh, my Honourable Friend had described earlier and as I described in the uh, closing stages of the Lord's considerations. I'd like to touch on two things. One raised by my honourable right honourable friend, member for Basingstoke, and that is we will have a planning bill before us before long. The planning bill has to include uh, proper separation of surface and foul water systems for new developments. It is the water running off hard standing in all new developments across the country, which, which will, through the right to connect, has the opportunity to be connected into foul water drainage systems, which is leading to this overwhelming quantity of water uh, causing the problems in the treatment works, which have not been expanded to cope with the development that we've had over the last 60 years or so. This is, is a problem that all successive governments have contributed to by not investing enough uh, in the infrastructure of our uh, drainage systems. Um, so the right to connect needs to be dealt with. It needs to be dealt with also through uh, having the subsystem to require separation by developers. And uh, I think that developers need to be able to uh, contribute to the capital costs of infrastructure works under the ground, which at present they don't. They have to con contribute to uh, the connection charge, but not to the capital works uh, which would allow full separation uh, to take place for new developments. And I think that is essential. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Mr. Paisley, I'd just like to encourage the government, the minister, who who's, I do pay tribute to the work that she's put into this to improve the Environment uh, Act as it went through the Lords in particular, that the priorities of Ofwat need to be adjusted. She's got the opportunity through the forthcoming strategic um, pricing, uh, uh, the, the SPS for Ofwat, uh, to be able to encourage them to focus no longer just on leakage and keeping bills down, but on keeping sewage out of our rivers by investing more in the treatment network for which our water companies are responsible. Carrie McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Paisley. A pleasure to see you in the chair, as always. And um, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Gower for her introductory remarks in this debate. As has been said, England has the worst river quality in Europe. 0% um, of rivers currently meet good chemical standards and only 14% meet good ecological standards. We've also heard raw sewage was dumped into rivers more than 400,000 times last year. And I do want to pay tribute to campaigners such as Surfers Against Sewage and the role that they play with the all-party group on ocean conservation. They've been pressing on this issue for... Um, a very long time now, and also the indefatigable Fergal Sharkey. I don't want to rehearse all the arguments we've had in terms of the environment bill measures, other than to say it's um, very disappointing that the government has repeatedly failed to back efforts by the Lords to protect our waters. I suspect we'll hear more from the um, Labour front bench spokesperson on that. 
Um, I'd rather not, because I've only got a few minutes anyway, and she has already spoken. Um, what I want to talk about specifically is about the local situation, but before I do that, I do want to express particular concerns about reports that raw sewage spills in Honiton are threatening the, fir threatening the first wild beaver colony to live on an English river for 400 years, which are part of a trial approved by the Minister's Department. I hope she'll agree with me. I think it's wonderful that beavers are being reintroduced into um, our natural environment, and I'm, I, you know, I'm very concerned about the threat to them. In Bristol, we have... Um, Particular issues that have arisen recently. Conham River Park is a popular wild swimming spot for local residents. And, um, Order. The... We have a division in the house. Oh. Um, we'll uh, come back in. Does that mean I start again? 15, 15 minutes. Uh, so on the hour.
May now be continued until 7.46. I call Kerry McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. I was saying before, <laughs> rudely interrupted. I just wanted to talk about uh, particular local concerns. Um, and I pay tribute to the, the Bristol Cable for doing a, an excellent report on this, from which I'm going to quote fairly extensively. There are two areas in Bristol where there seems to be particular concern. One is the Conham River Park. And I have to say, um, you know, this is a popular wild swimming spot. And um, one of my staffers went swimming there recently, and I heard rather more than I... <laughs> Suspended until 7.15. <laughs> 7.15. I'm sorry, I have to suspend the sitting until 7.15. Thank you.
Order. If we start now, we'll be finishing at 7.56, just as members have that in mind. And uh, I call for the third time this evening, <laughs> Kerry McCarthy. Right. I, I'm, I'm going to give up trying to talk order, about... Order, order. Oh. Call Kerry McCarthy. Oh, sorry. I'm going to give up trying to talk about the Connum River Park for a moment and talk about Worley Weir near Bath, which is another popular swimming spot. Multiple cases of sickness have been reported in swimmers there. Um, in most, one of the most recent incidents, just the week before a storm overflow four kilometres upstream had started releasing raw sewage into the Avon. Data since then, as I said, the Bristol Cable is reporting on this, showed that sewage was dumped from this overflow 67 times last year. In total, Wessex Water, which I think covers the um, minister's area as well, released sewage into the natural environment more than 14,000 times in the first eight months of this year. It has to be said that Wessex Water has denied that this would have caused swimmers to fall ill. They've suggested it was agricultural runoff or wildlife or whatever. Um, but... Obviously, you know, I mean, it, it's, I, I, I would argue that sewage is, is bears a fair part of the responsibility. The Conham Bathing Water Group has carried out tests, and I said that's the other spot I was talking about. It found that at their worst, E. coli levels were over 20 times what the WHO deems to be a sufficient level for people to go swimming in that water. The, we know that the cost of changing the sewage infrastructure would be massive. We know that that would be added to bills. But I think that this problem has just got too bad for us, for us not to um, seize the initiative and actually act. The Environment Agency has, has recently given the green light for water companies to dump even more sewage into the rivers due to Brexit-related chemical shortages. As has been said, we need a properly resourced Environment Agency and, this is, and we need long-term legally enforceable targets on water quality. This is a situation that can't just be allowed to, to slide. And I, I'd just like to hear from the, the Minister. Um, partly, I'm not quite sure what the process is, but the campaigners at Morley Weir and Conham River Park are campaigning for designated bathing water status. So if you've got any advice on how they could achieve that, that would be helpful. But how is she going to make sure that rivers in, in our area are suitable for swimming in? Thank you very much, Mr Paisley. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair today. Um, I, I would also thank my honourable friend, the member for Gower, for uh, securing this debate and, and for her opening remarks. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate on behalf of the 140 residents of Dulwich and West Norwood who signed the petition to ban raw sewage discharges and the thousands of others in my constituency for whom this is an important issue. As a member of the Environmental Audit Committee, I also pay tribute to our chair, the Right Honourable Member for Ludlow, for his uh, commitment and, and work on this issue over um, many months. I recently had the opportunity to visit uh, the River Windrush in Oxfordshire as a member of the committee, where a group of local residents have come together as Windrush Against Sewage Pollution to take action on the impact on the ecology of the River Windrush from Thames Water's frequent discharges into it. I pay tribute to their work, which has been instrumental in the struggle to hold water companies to account for the damage they cause to health and the environment by discharging raw sewage into our rivers. Windrush Against Sewage Pollution has engaged in citizen science over several years, monitoring the water quality and ecological diversity of the River Windrush. Through this data gathering, they are able to understand exactly the impact of raw sewage discharge and have discovered that raw sewage discharges are underreported, going undetected by the Environment Agency in as many as 96.5% of cases. All of the evidence points to the inadequacy of the Environment Agency's action on sewage discharge. On the same visit, we went to a Thames Water Treatment Works, which discharges into the River Windrush, and that revealed further issues with the water treatment and monitoring regime, which I want to highlight this evening. Specifically, that in addition to the problem of frequent, undetected, unsanctioned dis discharges of raw sewage, there are many substances which are harmful to the environment, which the water companies are not required either to measure or to treat. Amongst them, microplastics, which are present in both in river discharge and in sewage sludge, which is spread on the land for fertiliser, thereby potentially entering the food chain. Antibiotics at a time when there is a huge race against growing antibiotic resistance and hormones, which have an impact on the reproduction of fish and other aquatic life. We have a monitoring, treatment and enforcement framework for wastewater treatment and discharge, which is simply not fit for purpose for the serious environmental challenges we face. 
At the same time, water companies are also failing to invest adequately in their clean water infrastructure. Across my constituency, we have ageing water pipes put under additional strain by hilly topography. There are serious water leaks and bursts every single week, and I've been pressing Thames Water for years to invest in the pipe replacement we need to secure a reliable water supply for local residents and stop the terrible waste of drinking quality water that occurs whenever there's a leak. I'm pleased that in response to this pressure, the level of investment in my constituency has increased, but we are still very far from having a plan to replace all of the pipes that need replacement. And Thames Water still has a serious problem with the quality of its workmanship. <coughs> Almost without fail, as soon as replacement works finish in my constituency, a new leak occurs because the workmanship is so poor. There have been two instances of this just in the past three weeks. It happens all the time. We face a climate emergency and ecological crisis crisis. Nature recovery is a vital part of our response to climate change and river water quality is critical. Privatised water companies are not fit for the task. They already face competing priorities in terms of the need to invest both in clean water and water treatment infrastructure, trying to face in two different directions at the same time. And they also have to face in a third direction towards the return they are under constant pressure to deliver to their shareholders. This isn't a responsible way to run such a critical infrastructure, and it simply isn't working. We need the water industry to be returned to common ownership so that it can focus on delivering functioning clean water infrastructure and being part of the solution to the challenge of nature recovery. Our rivers and our communities can't wait any longer. Thank you. Gareth Thomas. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in this debate, and like others, I uh, join in um, congratulating my Honourable friend for Gower for securing um, the, uh, the slot to open the debate. And in particular, I uh, want to underline her figure of 39 million tonnes of raw sewage uh, dumped in the River Thames in um, 2019. And as someone who uh, loves walking uh, by the Thames, uh, occasionally swimming in it, uh, and certainly canoeing uh, on it, that figure does give uh, even me. Uh, pause uh, for, uh, for thought. I thought the contributions from my honourable friend for Salford and for um, uh, Weaver Vale and indeed for Dulwich, um, uh, as well as my honourable friend for Bristol, were very powerful in terms of the critique uh, of uh, ownership uh, by the uh, water companies uh, to date. The 40% uh, hike in bills in real terms since uh, privatisation, the almost £60 billion in payments to shareholders uh, since uh, privatisation, and the uh, over £50 billion and more that has been uh, loaded uh, onto uh, water companies in the form of debt to pay uh, those uh, payments uh, to uh, shareholders. One of the problems with the argument that the Honourable Gentleman for uh, Ludlow and the Honourable Gentleman for um, Keithley, I beg your pardon, and um, indeed for the Honourable Gentleman for a constituency in Kent that I should, should be able to remember, and I apologise to him that I uh, can't have made, is to gloss over the issue of, um, of ownership and, uh, in particular, the fact that annual investment in water supply infrastructure was lower in 2018 than it was in 1990. And that does rather uh, uh, suggest that there is a, there has been for some time a serious question mark over as to whether or not privatisation is um, delivering. The particular well, issue... Gentlemen, allow me, if you just reference me... Of course, OK. Not done. For allowing me, uh, me to defend my remarks. I made no remarks, no, didn't discuss the subject of privatisation, but as he's raised it and accused me of having done so, I'd just like to ask him whether he recognises that the amount of capital investment invested by the water companies in the 10 years prior to privatisation was half the amount invested in capital treatment works in the 10 years post-privatisation. Thomas. Well, the Honourable Gentleman will have to forgive me. I was uh, concentrating on other things in the 10 years uh, before privatisation. I'm not quite um, uh, that, uh, that old. And if he shares uh, our concerns on this, on this side of the House about um, the quality of performance of the privatised water companies, then I, um, I, welcome, uh, I welcome that. I recognise that the Minister is not likely uh, today to give a commitment uh, to bring the water companies back into public ownership of uh, one sort or another. And uh, <laughs> uh, I therefore perhaps try to suggest a third way 
um, and to uh, uh, and to suggest to her that one of the ways in which we could maintain the pressure on uh, water companies to deliver action to bring down um, the amount of sewage that is being dumped in our streams long after the uh, new cycle has uh, has moved uh, move on to other issues is to give the consumers of water companies more um, power power uh, in the form of perhaps uh, a requirement that any increase in bills would have to be approved by the consumers of uh, the water company. Um, if the honourable lady, were, right, right honourable lady, perhaps were willing to be radical, any uh, increase in the salary of the chief executive and board of the water company having to be approved um, by the consumers of that water company. I think there should be a, uh, a, a water users committee, a consumer uh, committee for each uh, water. Uh, company and that uh, uh, committee to have real powers to hold the board of the water company um, to uh, to account. At the moment, there are only two uh, water uh, two com uh, committees without any substantive powers to cover the whole of the operation of the English uh, English water companies, and quite clearly, they are not having um, much uh, impact. So, uh, I would urge the uh, honourable lady to take away. The need to give consumers more direct um, power, more direct say in the operation of um, uh, the water companies um, uh, for which uh, we all, uh, on which we all rely. Call Mr. Graham Morris. If, if it's more comfortable for you to remain seated, seated for your speech, I'm more than happy to facilitate it that way. It's very kind of you, uh, uh, um, Mr. Paisley, and I, I, I do apologise. Um, to, to you and other members of the committee. I, I've either got a trapped nerve or a pulled muscle. And I, ju I just can't bob up and down. It's, it's, it's very in vogue to have a bad as, back at the as moment. A, as, as long as I'm up or down, I'm okay. It's going up and down. That's the problem. <laughs> if you bear with me. I, I am grateful to, to uh, be able to be to be able to speak in this debate, Mr Paisley. I'm thankful for, for you calling me. And I, I would also like to express my appreciation uh, to my honourable friend for Gower for opening and leading this important debate. Water companies are polluting our bathing waters, our rivers and beaches, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to raise concerns that have been expressed to me by my constituents. Um, we are told, and the Honourable Member, the Right Honourable Member for Basingstoke spoke in her contribution about storm overflow events, uh, and we are told that combined sewage overflows are used in extreme weather conditions. However, in 2020, water companies dis discharged raw sewage into rivers in England more than 40,000 times. We have seen illegal dumping, dumping from water companies being allowed, that are allowed to self-report such spills since 2010. Uh, and, Mr Paisley, we simply cannot permit privately owned water company monopolies to police themselves. Professor Peter Hammond, the visiting scientist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, told ministers, and I quote, the evidence suggests that in the last decade, early dumping of untreated sewage to rivers has been at least 10 times more frequent than EA monitoring and prosecution suggest. I represent the coastal community in County Durham's only section of coastline with Durham's 2020 um, current County of Culture bid, the East Durham Heritage Coast should be a jewel. Unfortunately, despite a stream of press releases from Durham County Council's Conservative Coalition declaring various environmental and ecological emergencies, repeated concerns about sewage discharges on the East Durham coast seem to have been ignored. You've seen excuses, inaction, and a failure to protect public health. The lack of interest in protecting, promoting um, clean water on the East Durham coast by the council is a scandal. Residents using the Safer Seas and Rivers Act, uh, um, uh, pointed out by my honourable friend, the member for Salford, uh, and promoted by my uh, honourable friend, the Shadow Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, will realise that there have been 113 pollution alerts for county, the County Durham coastline so far in 2021. 
In my constituency, Durham County Council deflect any inquiries to the Environment Agency. However, anyone watching recent interviews and being given by the Environment Agency spokespeople would be forgiven for thinking that water company representatives um, rather, that they were water company representatives rather than a public regulator. Combined sewer overflows should be a safety valve to use sparingly and only in extreme weather conditions. Instead, legal and illegal dumping of sewage seems to be standard practice. Uh, and indeed, the government are complicit in this situation arising. I, I, I've called consistently for, for this essential public asset to be brought under public control. Ministers need to explain to the public why they value the private monopoly interests of water companies over the health and welfare and well-being of the public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Paisley. And uh, I thank uh, the member for Gower for bringing this debate today and the petition of 111,000 people signed, 257, I believe, from my constituency. There's something just disgusting about this. Hundreds of thousands of knowing discharges of raw sewage into our rivers every year, some of which are because of storm overflow, but only some. Some, to my mind, are quite deliberate because it's simply cheaper to do it that way and, they, and the water companies think they can get away with it. There are, it is true, as members opposite have said, big infrastructure needs in our water industry. I absolutely understand and accept that. And the uh, 57 billion that's been paid out to shareholders and in dividends over the past few decades could have gone an awful long way to stemming the leaks of fresh water and providing a better infrastructure system as well. And it is worth just thinking of what is included in the waste that ends up in our rivers. Yes, it is sewage. It is also plastics. It's also chemicals. It's also bleach. It's a whole lot of stuff. And when it goes into the rivers, it ends up in the sea with all the foul levels of pollution that come as a result of that. I was talking to my friend, the member for Plymouth, earlier before we came in, and he said, what about the rivers in your constituency? And I said, well, actually, there aren't any, because they've all been culverted and put underground many, many years ago. So I've no idea how bad they are, but I suspect they're very bad because nobody ever sees them, and they appear somewhere in the Thames a bit later on. But many other people in many other places see it all the time. And I think we should pay tribute to some wonderful people that have done great work in trying to clean up our rivers. Those that regularly, voluntarily monitor water quality in our rivers. Those that campaign to end the culverting of rivers and the canalisation of rivers so we have uh, a more natural environment and floodplains. And also those brilliant people, particularly on the north coast of Cornwall, that have uh, formed surface against the sewage that have been so successful in drawing attention to the filth that's in our seas as a result of all of this. And so I think we have to then ask ourselves the question, I've been in the House long enough to remember when water was privatised. I absolutely voted against it and opposed it all the way through. And I think of the glory of the Metropolitan Water Board and what it achieved the flood control and flood prevention it achieved and the huge investment it put in. That is now owned by a series of uh, fly-by-night hedge funds and if you try to get hold of somebody who actually owns Thames Water, good luck, good luck I say, you might or might not find out about them. So the, the argument for public ownership of our water is absolutely irrefutable. And before somebody on that side decides to call me a Neanderthal 1960s, 70s, 50s, 40s or whatever for wanting public ownership, I'd simply say this. The public ownership I want for our water industry is genuine public ownership, is community control, is the involvement of local authorities, is the involvement of water workers, is the involvement of those people that are concerned about our environment, and yes, local businesses in those areas so that we do improve our, our water quality, our river quality and, and all the rest. And in the last 33 seconds I've got, I'd simply say this. There's also a big role here for local authorities in planning. Create more porous spaces. Don't pave over everything. 
Don't allow everything to be paved over. And indeed, it is perfectly possible to look at the heavily urbanised built environment that I represent, for example, in my constituency. It's the smallest, most urbanised place in the country. It is possible, even there, to create more porous services, which means the water flows directly into the ground and improves the water table, rather than polluting, uh, forcing sewage into our rivers, which causes all that pollution. Thank you, Mr Paisley. Thank, Thank you. you. Rosie Duffy. Thank you, Mr. Plaisley, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, and thank you to my friend from Gower for securing the debate. Um, for several years, Whitstable in my constituency has suffered from the effects of sewage leaking, or in actual fact being dumped into our seas along our beautiful stretch of the East Kent coast. More than 111,000 people clearly feel as angry about this as the nearly 900 or so constituents in my area who've signed this petition today. In a seaside town, it should go without saying that so much of our everyday way of life revolves around the sea. We have a fishing industry, swimming groups, sailing and paddleboard schools, and of course tourism, which is right at the heart of our economy. We should not be having to just get used to these increasingly frequent incidents which keep us away from our beaches. Not only are we unable to swim or sail, basic everyday things like hanging out, washing, opening our windows, including in my office, Walking the dog are impossible on the worst days. One of the loveliest aspects of living in such a beautiful part of the country is that during the pandemic, our daily exercise was a walk around Whitstable Harbour, taking the dog up to our local coastal nature reserve, or just jogging along the seafront and maybe picking up some locally caught seafood on the way home. But instead, we are now often avoiding a dip in the sea or a visit to the beach hut in case bits of human waste float past us. Instead of good, fresh, healthy sea air, our children have been gulping down lungfuls of foul-smelling, polluted stuff that contains plenty of potentially toxic bacteria. No wonder my constituents have had enough. In the summer, I held a public meeting so that residents could demand answers and action from Southern Water, the company responsible for our waterworks, and paid by us, for us, for the safe removal and treatment of waste. In July this year, Southern Water was handed a record £90 million fine for thousands of illegal dumping incidents. This was just the latest in a list of fines dating, dating back to 2007. One has to ask why essentially, despite these frequent and increasingly huge fines, nothing has changed. And as Mr Justice Johnson said when he hand down that fine, handed down that fine, it's the greatest sewage scandal in this country since the great stink of 1858, which forced our predecessors in this place to take action and build the first public sewers. Could it be that a profit-driven private company such as Southern Water would rather pay fines than invest in expensive but completely necessary upgrades to the sewage infrastructure that would stop these incidents from happening altogether? The damage to my community, the health, well-being and way of life is a far greater cost than that paid out by a private company. No wonder some of my constituents are now refusing to pay their water bills. They understandably feel that they have paid more than enough already. So I echo the, mem echo the members from Salford and Eccles and Dulwich and others in their view that companies responsible pro for providing these services should be publicly owned and publicly controlled and not prim primarily driven by making money for shareholders. Instead of swimming with sharks in the Cayman Islands, we need to enable my constituents to swim in clean waters. Following the summer public meeting, I've continued to meet with Southern Water, like my honourable friend from Planet North, and they regularly, individually, represent good people who are willing to engage with groups such as the great Save Our Seas in Whitstable and other Whitstable activist groups. But it's the wider corporate attitude that urgently needs to change. We want to be able to swim, eat our shellfish and breathe healthy air, and that should be something we take for granted instead of having to protest about on a weekly basis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call the opposition spokesperson, Luke Pollard. Thank you very much, Mr Paisley. And uh, it has been a good debate so far that I think has reflected the strength of feeling that is felt in all our communities, no matter which party represents those communities. Um, I want to thank in particular my friend from uh, Gower for presenting this debate in such a coherent and clear way. There's a lot of people that feel strongly about this, uh, about this topic, including the 207 people from Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport who have signed it. And I think that is testament 
to the campaigners who have continued to raise this area for quite some time. I'm grateful for Ferry Harmer, um, who organised this petition, but also to uh, campaigners from Surfers Against Sewage, uh, Fergal Sharkey, uh, wild swimmers the nation over, and people who just think this is not right. And there are many of those. We are living in a climate in ecological emergency, and that matters. But it matters because it challenges us to do things differently than we had done before. And that is one of the reasons why the sense of outrage about river pollution, river sewage, has been so intense during this period. Now, I agree with the Honourable Member from Basingstoke, who said in her remarks that facts are important, and I agree with, with her in that respect. And the facts are sobering, I think, when it comes to river pollution. Not one English river is in a healthy condition, with not one meeting good chemical standards. England having the worst river pollution in Europe. 400,000 discharges of raw sewage into our rivers and seas last year. They are scary facts. But I, I, I'm halfway through, but I'm happy to. Yes. Um, I just remember, does he not regret um, some of the misinformation which drove so much fear and anxiety amongst our constituents, particularly that this bill enabled raw sewage to be, for the first time, pumped into rivers and seas. That's just factually not correct. Doesn't he agree? Pollard. Well, she'd waited for my second sentence, and she would have found me agreeing with her in certain bits of that, because we do need a debate based on facts on this one here. And it is important we get to the fact. The facts are our rivers are dirty. They've been dirty for too long. They've been dirty for the past 11 years. And it is the fact that we need them to be cleaned up of this. That it, certainly, it certainly is true. It certainly is true. And this matters. But the climate and ecological emergency, when we passed that motion as a House, should have changed our approach. I'm very glad it changed the approach uh, of the member for Ludlow, who I have to say has been an incredible champion of cleaner rivers. Uh, and someone who I've enjoyed our conversations about how we encourage the government to be in a better place. And I'm glad that they have moved in that direction. But there is still more to do here. And that is why we can't accept us being the dirty man of Europe any longer. And even though the government has moved, and it is fair to say that they have moved, they really did not want to. And that is important to note. But they have moved. And that was partly because of the screeching public outrage when Conservative MPs were whipped to vote against a motion that, just, that called for the ending of raw sewage discharges. Now, I am not a fan of abuse on social media. I'm not a fan of uh, a nasty side of our politics. And I recognise there are members on all sides of the House who have been subject to some pretty horrendous stuff recently, including over sewage. We need a debate on the facts, but we also need a debate with more urgency than we have seen for quite some time. And that is important that we uh, do this. Now, the debate uh, has been a good one with some really fantastic contributions from both sides of the House. And I want to just briefly, before I return to Mark, just talk about a number of those. Um, I do think we need to challenge disinformation wherever we see it. And one of the best ways of challenging disinformation is for more information to be in the public domain. And I support the, um, the remarks by my uh, friend from Harrow West, who talks about the need for putting more power into the hands of consumers to understand what's happening in their communities. I have, Mr Paisley, been promoting a brilliant interactive map on the Rivers Trust website to any parliamentary colleague who happens to talk to me about sewage, including those that don't happen to talk to me about sewage, because it allows you to zoom in on where you live, to see where raw sewage is being discharged. And I think it is disturbing to see how close to many of our communities this discharge is taking place. It's not happening far, far away. It's happening in all our communities. And the member for Islington North might have made a point about rivers being um, uh, locked away in concrete tubes, but that doesn't stop the sewage emerging at some point. The understanding of what is happening here is important because we need consumers to understand it so they support greater investment in it. Now, the Minister has used a variety of figures over the past month about how much addressing raw sewage discharges would cost. I'm looking forward to hearing where those figures came from, which I still have not had the workings out from. But there will be a cost to this. And there are, I think, a variety of uh, options about where that money should come from. I have a huge amount of sympathy for the argument that many of my Labour colleagues have today forwarded about using shareholder dividends and water being uh, uh, a public, uh, held in the public interest in the public sector with genuine common ownership. And I think there's enormous uh, uh, method there uh, to potentially look at it. But I look at the party in power now and say, where is the, where's the plan here? 
because we need to have a plan for raw sewage discharges that not only talks about storm overflows, but talks about a creaking sewage system. Now, the Secretary of State in the compromise amendment put into the Environment Bill that uh, was voted on was careful in the use of words, talking about storm overflows. And I commend the bill writers in DEFRA for using that, enabling a focus on one part of a sewage system that is broken, but omitting the rest of it. There is routine discharge of raw sewage into rivers and seas, not in the event of extreme weather from combined sewer outflows, but as a result of daily discharges. The fines that we've seen levied against companies, including the 90 million towards Southern, show that this system is not working. I agree with the uh, comments from both sides of the house, house earlier today when we talk about the delays in prosecution. And I want to encourage the Minister to look again at how much uh, budget the Environment Agency has been given to make sure that there are no further cuts to the Environment Agency's budget and a real emphasis for them to bring further prosecutions. I also want to see higher fines for water companies because it's clear that the levels of fines are not yet producing a change in behaviour in those water companies that are stopping raw sewage uh, being routinely discharged. And the word routine really matters here, Mr Paisley, because it means every single day. While we have been debating routinely discharging it, not because of extreme weather that's taken place in the last hour, but because a sewage system that can't cope with the level of demand being placed on it, a lack of investment into it. Now, the, um, the bill that we have passed in the past week. The Environment Act sets out changes to the way that raw sewage will be reported on, which are welcome, sets out the need to produce plans, which I hope will be welcome. I want to see what they look like. But they don't set out, it didn't set out a timetable for when the scandal of raw sewage discharges will be brought to an end, nor did it set out any interim targets, a sense of direction. And I think, in a, in a very meaningful way, Every member who is here today wants to see an end to raw sewage being discharged into our seas and into our rivers. But we need a clear timetable to hold any government to account to see how their performance is going. But we also need to delve into the workings of the water industry. And the member for Ludlow is, is right when he talks about the need to strengthen Ofwat and the SPS guidance that the minister is preparing. That will, that will influence the changes for water companies in the next pricing period. But what changes are happening in this pricing period? What changes are happening right now in water companies? Because they know they don't have to invest in the same way until the next pricing period. Because Ofwat has set the pricing controls, has set the investment strategies, and although many water companies fell foul of the business plans in this period, I doubt we will see that huge surge in action to close raw sewage outfalls and invest in treatment until the next price period. So the challenge is what do we do about it now? And that I think really matters as well. What we discharge into our rivers is not always easily seen. And we do need a clear plan to understand how much will be stopped, how much will be properly treated, how much will be carefully looked after in the future. So I hope when the Minister gets to her feet, she'll be able to set out a clear timetable. Because the people that signed the petition and the people that are in all of our communities want action to be taken. They want it to be taken against a timetable. They want it to be measurable and demonstrable. They want to hold to account the people who are responsible for it to see whether they are doing what they have been told to do, what they promised to do, or not. And if they haven't, what the consequences will be. I look forward to hearing the Minister's remarks shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call the Minister, Rebecca Pye. Minister. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. It's absolutely a pleasure, as ever, to see you there. And uh, I would obviously like to thank all honourable members and friends who have taken part in this heated debate and to those who signed the petition. Uh, and uh, whilst I really respect the, uh, the strength, the feeling, the passion in that petition, I do want to say at the outset, I believe it was probably started when that social media campaign was whipped up, for which I, 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 I you know, and I'm sorry, and a lot of misinformation was indeed spread about that. So we need to just get over that and make sure that never happens again. That's not to say I do understand the passion about this issue, which I think we all share. And quite frankly, I'm personally also horrified by a lot of what we've seen. And that's why I'm so proud that as the Environment Minister, I've made water quality a priority. And indeed, 
Um, so is this government. And as was so eloquently said by a number of members on this side, uh, particularly the uh, right honourable member from Basingstoke, we now have a chain of actions that will deal with this. Many of them, of course, are triggered through the World Leading Environment Act. And I was sorry, whatever the Shadow Minister says, and I do, as he knows, have uh, great respect for him, our, our Labour colleagues didn't, in the end, vote for that to make that duty, that, that law, to get water companies to uh, reduce harm from storm sewage overflows. So the tables were turned, and for that, I'm sorry. But I think we need, again, to get over that too, and we all need to move on. So I'm not going to take an intervention on that. What I, no, I'm not going to. And what I will also say is... Um, this issue is devolved, so, um, and thank you to the Honourable Member from Gower uh, for, uh, for bringing the, uh, the debate, but obviously she knows it is, it is a devolved issue and it's for the individual governments there to, um, to, to have their own powers, although indeed Wales has joined um, a great many of the powers in the bill. I will give way. The, the Minister for giving way. On, on that point, I, I, you know, I'm leading the debate for the yeah. Petitions Committee, but also it is an issue, it's a UK-wide issue, which I hope that she will work with the devolved nations to address. Minister. I thank her hugely for that, because I've got pain to offer there uh, to, do, to do more. Uh, and just on misinformation, of course, uh, indeed, our rivers, um, whilst the, I'm not defending their quality, they are comparable to densely populated rivers in Europe, so that is the misinformation as well. Anyway, let's get on. We do know that this storm overflow system is an old Victorian plumbing system, uh, you know, and it's, it's not, uh, in many cases, fit for purpose with our growing population, our climate change, and our frequent heavy extreme weather incidents that we're now getting. And many honourable friends and members have made reference to the fact that the, the whole system does need uh, improving. Um, and I have been clear that the frequency with which these storm sewage uh, dis uh, overflows are used, and they are supposed to be in emergency use, are used far too frequently, and it is totally unacceptable, and I have said this frequently. Uh, and, and we are the first government to take decisive action through the Environment Bill uh, on these storm overflows. And indeed, I established the Storm Overflows Task Force to look into this and to inform us. Uh, and I thank the Honourable Member from, um, uh, from Keatley for, for, for recognising this. And he was on the Bill Committee and did, did great work. Um, so um, what I wanted to say is the, pe the petition itself actually calls for a ban uh, on uh, or basically elimination of these storm overflows. So that ambition is, of course, commendable. Um, but, however, uh, we do need to very, very briefly... Hello, Hayes. I'm really grateful to the Minister for giving way. She, she, she mentioned the petition um, at the start of her remarks, and she mentioned that she thought that the petition had probably been started in response to the, um, the, the social media campaign. Um, I just wanted, as a point of clarification, to point out that the petition was started more than six months ago, and indeed the government published its own response to the petition on the 5th of May earlier this year. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And obviously, as I said, you know, I, I share the, the, the passion of the people that signed the petition, so I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. But what I did want to say, it calls for the complete elimination of storm overflows. Uh, and what we need to look at is how possible is that? Uh, you know, what is the function of the overflows in emergency situations? And to look at, um, just to look at the whole issue absolutely in the round, uh, the Storm Overflows Evidence Project report was recently um, published to give some, uh, shed some light on this and the costs we're looking at. And the Shadow Minister keeps asking, asking about that. He can read all about it. It's an independent um, survey um, project, and it's published on gov.uk. So, and that highlights these costs of it, complete elimination could be between would be between 350 billion and 600 billion pounds. And what I also want to say is, when we're looking at all these things, we do need also to consider all of the other things we have to deal with in terms of water, to do with phosphates, nitrates, um, soil in the water. It, it, it's been referred to by a number of right honourable friends, and they are right. This is a very complicated picture, and we are we are dealing with it, and we need to. Um, so. Uh, so I wanted to go on to say that, um, you know, work is underway on this time frame in, in terms of um, reducing uh, and maybe potentially elimination of these um, overflows. And um, 
And actually, there were some interesting points made, uh, the, the, the Honourable Member from Harrow, about you know, co consumers' involvement, bringing the public along so that they understand what we're doing. Uh, and indeed, water companies do consult consumers, but of course, it doesn't change their obligation to meet their requirements in law and regulation. But that's where government's direction to off what the regulator is so important. And we've just done our gra draft strategic policy, and we flagged this issue of storm overflows and reducing the harm for the first time ever. Uh, and also putting the environment at the top of the agenda. And, and I'm sure we all share the view that that is the right thing to do. Uh, so I wanted then to, to, to talk a bit about, you know, enforcement has been raised a number of times. Uh, and action is taken, and rightly it must be taken. But I get the, I understand the frustration about how long it can take. You know, the Southern Water uh, uh, enforcement it, it took years, but it was £90 million. That was a clear message. And Thames Tideway, um, Thames Water are also have had some very significant fines, but indeed now they are spending the £4.4 billion on the Thames Tideway uh, tunnel. And that will be a game changer in, in rightly treating sewage that goes into the Thames. So we have seen progress, but that's not to say we don't need to go a great deal further. Um, and we have seen some action. The Shadow Minister keeps saying what's happening now. There is some action. Yes, we need more. But through the task force, uh, we instigated a call for action. Oh, it's happening right now. And the water companies are spending £144 million of additional investment on storm overflows in this 2020-25 period. Uh, and that's very important. That's on top of a £3 billion that they're already spending uh, on the environment. I will give way. I'm grateful for the Minister giving way. I, 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 I just wonder whether she could square the, the, the two challenges here. One, it's going to cost £660 billion, which she's just told us, versus if water companies spend £144 million now, that's sufficient to deal with it. Those are two very different extremes. Why is more not being spent now? And how is a such a paltry sum supposed to deal with a problem that her, she herself said only moments ago could cost £660 billion? Well, I thank him for that, but I don't think he's really listening to what I'm saying. Um, I, I, what I said is they've taken some action now to start to invest in some of the uh, facilities they do indeed need. I didn't say that they were doing everything that they needed to do, but the point is they're not waiting till the next price review, was the point that I was trying to make. Uh, and, and I've mentioned this strategic policy statement to um, off what the regulator was absolutely crucial. Uh, and... Uh, and, la and just last week, uh, we set out in the Environment Bill that we're instructing a, you know, a legal footing through the, through the Act so that there will be a statutory requirement for water companies to progressively reduce the harm from sewage from these overflows. Uh, and it, it refers to harm not just to the environment, but also to public health. That's something new that uh, we've got in there. That wasn't even in the Duke of Wellington's amendment, and that's been added. And I think everybody here will agree, especially the honourable members and friends, uh, with their bathing uh, uh, areas, uh, the keep the area, and that's the first inland one, and all credit to uh, my honourable friend. And then a Bristol East, I know Wall uh, Wally Weir, uh, because... Uh, lots of my school friends used to go swimming there because I went to school in Bath, and I'm horrified at her data. So I wouldn't, would be interested in hearing more about that. But if she wants to apply for one of these bathing water quality statuses, it's very clear how to do it. And indeed, we ask local authorities, we write to them every year to say, have you got an area you would like to put forward? So happy to, to, um, to, to, you know, to progress that if it's at all possible. Uh, and then I just wanted to um, say in the, in the Act, which is now an Act, Mr Chair, which we're all so proud of, um, there are so many things in there. There's a whole page of duties, plans, monitoring, and the Honourable Member from Gower mentioned the really important need for data. She's absolutely right about that. We, in order to really tackle these issues, we absolutely have to know what's going on, uh, and we, we don't need to wait for ages. We can start, but we do still need the data. And there are timelines in there for all of that monitoring and reporting. And, um, there's, the, and there's a system for holding water companies to account if they don't do the right thing. And I have to thank the right honourable member from Ludlow for all the work he did on this. And I think he fully understands that data issue. It's so important. And really crucial in there is the need is, the, is now that every water company has to produce a sewage management plan. And they didn't have to do that before, so that will help. And now, I just want to say as well, because there's been so much mention of water companies, so last week I called them in, mentioned this on the floor of the House, you know, before we went in there 
um, to, to, for, for more of our thrashing out uh, over the final amendments. But, you know, I read the Riot Act to them about the need, the expectation for them to do better. And indeed, we do need to work with them to, to, to make sure that this happens. Uh, and now we've been very, very clear that if we don't see action, uh, we, will, we will take enforcement powers. And there are clear enforcement powers through, um, through the EA, uh, who issue the permits, through um, the regulator, and indeed then through government in a, in a new power in the Environment Bill. And of course, ultimately, the Office for Environmental Protection. So all of this system, Chair, is now in place. Uh, so I think I'm going to wind up. I do want to thank all honourable friends and members, because I think we share, uh, we share an issue about water quality. I mean, I see it as the stuff of life. It is the precious thing of life. Uh, it, you know, it, it is the lifeblood. That and soil, another of my favourite subjects. You know, we, it's our duty to look after it. And uh, I just wanted to end by saying, um, of course, it is a very complex issue, and those... Uh, the, the right honourable member for Thanet North and others have talked about this need and from Basingstoke to pull together other departments and to talk about the, uh, the building requirements and we are indeed um, doing work right now a review on um, the SUDS uh, in Schedule 3 that will include the right to connect really really important that we pull all these things together and it's not often I agree with the honourable member from Islington but he's absolutely right about the semi-permeable driveways and membranes. Uh, I'm a gardener and I've talked about this forever and the honourable member from um, Salford should go and visit the living lab at Salford University. It's amazing what it's showing people to do with grey water harvesting, underwater tanks, uh, green walls and it's brilliant uh, and it's in her constituency. I had a visit, visit. So on that note, I hope you've made it very clear we're taking this very seriously. The measures are in place but of course there's more to do. Thank you Minister. Thank you, the question is that the House has considered e-petition 582336 leading to the discharge of sewage by water companies. As many as are of the opinion say aye. On the contrary, no, the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Order, order, the sitting stands adjourned. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.